What's up, everybody? Welcome to Podcast Now. I'm Alex. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing Blink 182's Nine. Now, this is their uh, eighth official studio album, although you could technically make an argument for Nine. But we're going to be going over uh, everything about this album. I'm going to talk about it just generally, and I'm going to go into a few songs. Normally, I will go into every song in an album, but I'll explain why I'm not going to do it with this one. And that's generally because, and to kind of start off with talking about this album, I was just flat out not impressed. Um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of us could see this coming. I did see a lot of reviews yesterday already published on YouTube. Kind of made me envious. I was like, where did all these people get the, the music from so early? Um, but, you know, I read some. I didn't want to read. I didn't want to I didn't want to hear what other people had to say, but I wanted to form my own opinions on it. And I saw the description of a couple people saying, like, well, it's not awful, but it's pretty bad. Like, it's just bland. And that's pretty much the extent of what I read. And what I'll tell you is, after listening to it, I feel the same. This isn't the worst album I've ever heard in my life. Now, I only listen to a few select bands, so maybe I actually can make the argument it is. It's just so average and so, like, empty. Whatever, the, and, and here's the thing. I love Blink-182. I think they're a phenomenal band. I think they're all extremely, Travis Barker, I think, is one of, if not the best drummers in the world. Uh, Mark Hoppus is amazing. Obviously, has been there from the start. And Matt Skiba, I thought in California, I actually did a review of California, I thought it worked well. I thought what they had going for them, the, the pros of that album were something to build off of, and they really didn't. They didn't build off of anything that they built in California. The one positive is there was not one na 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 song in this entire thing. There was not one instance of that in these fifteen songs. So that is very very good. I'm very very proud of them for that. But on the on the other side of it, they lost any personality, any like energy that that album had. And I do think you know I know people had to have problems with bored to death and, and stuff like that. Uh, but I thought there were some very very good like gems in in there that that you have to listen to the full album. Teenage satellites I thought it was a phenomenal song songs like california los angeles there were home is such a lonely place i think is one of the better blink songs ever created i truly do believe that so there were a lot of really awesome songs on that album that weren't even necessarily singles so when we're hearing blame it on my youth the generational divide when we're hearing these songs it's like all right well hopefully the album has some of those hidden gems and i'll say it had two it had two songs that at least provided something. Uh, what I, and I, what I also will say is Dark Side, you know, the music video aside, the music video is cringeworthy. I, I feel like maybe it was intended to be that. I think it was just meant to be fun. And if you look at it for what it is, it's like, all right, you know, the kids with their stupid dancing aside, it's, it's you know, whatever. But the song itself is very, very catchy. I think it's a really, really solid song. And so that leads to problems. I mean, Dark Side is my favorite song. I think the best overall song on this entire album. And still, it wouldn't make it into like a best of Blink-182 list, which is saying something. And then when I listened to the album, I was like, all right, something can catch me. So hopefully something can catch me, right? And to me, Heaven and Pin the Grenade were the only two songs. Heaven Heaven like is a little bit catchy and has some cool riffs to it and pin their grenade I think is is a more catchy song there were some songs on some emo blank word uh, that song has something to it a uh, hung over you has something to it there's a couple times where the song especially opens up especially towards like the last five six songs. They have really cool openings where they'll do different things with piano, with guitar, with just electronics in general, maybe some different drum beats. They'll do something that'll make it somewhat catchy, somewhat different, like it'll sound like it's going somewhere. But then here's the deal. We just go into the same old Blink-182. Not even the old Blink-182, like Tom DeLonge Blink-182, but like what this entire album is all about and really what the worst of California was is predictability and just like no no spirit no passion you know they do a lot of electronics a lot of voice you know manipulation and I don't know why they constantly need for the voices to not just feel electronic where they have just all the help of electronics in the world. I don't know why you need that. Uh, even Neighborhoods, uh, uh, Blink-182, when, when Tom DeLonge came back, that really didn't have all that many you know, voice manipulations to it. And that was a phenomenal album, I think. 
you know, I know a lot of people had a lot of problems with it when it came out, but now a lot of people have warmed up to it. I think it's a phenomenal album for a lot of different reasons. So you have their voices being changed when they really don't need to. It's not very pure when you do that. And I've said that for basically any artist ever. I want pure, raw emotion. I just want your voice. We can hear these two live. We know they're honestly not the strongest singers in the world. Mark Hoppus, I think, has gotten a lot better, but they're not like the most, like they don't sound, if you recorded them just live in studio and then you did them live, you know, on, on the stage, uh, you know, you would be able to, you'd, you'd know if something was changed or not. And so you can constantly tell us like they don't actually sound this good. Now, you know, are you going to fix their voices a little bit with, with uh, engineering and stuff? Sure. But at the same time, I do want a little bit of emotion and the electronics take away from that. And also the literal effect of like when their voices start far away, like it's in the distance and then it brings it up to you. You know what I mean? That that effect, that happens like every song here, especially with Matt Skiba. They do that quite often. And, and Mark Hoppus just always has like two versions of himself singing on top of each other. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. It's like modern day pop that I don't need in a Blink album. And then the, the predictability part. Every single song goes back and forth between the two. Now, I think under the right circumstances and used wisely, that can work. Now, Blink-182 is one of the very rare bands that have two main singers, right? They have the guitarist, whoever it may be, Tom or Matt, singing, and they have Mark singing. They don't need to go back and forth every single song. Remember in Neighborhoods when an entire song, Ghost on the Dance Floor, was just Tom. Now, yeah, Mark Hoppus did like a couple lines in the background, but like he wasn't actually a part of the song, let's say, singing-wise. Um, Heart's All Gone, you know? There's a lot of songs on that album, Love is Dangerous for the most part, but there's a lot of songs that are just driven, and you go back in, in the day with Blink-182, uh, you know, Anima of the State even, there's a going away to college, is just Mark. So there's tons of songs, tons of examples where just one of them does the whole song. Then there's ideas that they can bounce back and forth with each other, okay? Up All Night is a phenomenal uh, example recently of them going back and forth, but they never repeat the same line they're like telling the story of the song and they're going back and forth in these songs and and they did it in California too and it was definitely a warning sign they are unable one of them and i feel like it's matt is unable to lead an entire song by himself they constantly need both of them I don't know why Mark Hoppus couldn't have his own song. I don't know why Matt Skiba couldn't have their own song. They're unable to for some reason. They feel that every single song needs to have one of them start it with the verse, one of them do the chorus, the other one does the verse, and the same one does the chorus. That is the formula of every single song on the entire album. Every except maybe what generational divide, which is them singing over each other, where you can't even hear what Matt Skiba is saying unless you have unless you have the lyrics in front of you. You don't know what he's saying because there's just a lot going on, and that's another thing too. Is sometimes the vocals get mixed up because there are so many effects going on. Even though when you look at it, it's a very non-heavy guitar and bass sounding album. It's a lot of electronics. There's very little, I'd say, actual uh, you musical instruments, like pure musical instruments. So I feel like the more I'm talking about it, the more I'm getting upset at it. And I think that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm trying to keep things concise. But those are the main problems is lack of originality. All these songs, for the most part, sound exactly the same. If you think they have something good to them well get ready for it to become average and predictable within five seconds and that happens with the the last songs like i said pin the grenade maybe but a lot of those no heart to speak of ransom uh, hung over you remember to forget a lot of those songs they may have one unique thing in them whether it's in the beginning whether it's in the middle whether it's in the end but that's it the whole don't expect the whole song to be original and different because they can't do it because they just go back to what feels comfortable to them, I guess. And it sucks because I know they're talented. I know they can do better than this. I know that they're great guys. I truly do believe that they have like the best in mind. I think they did work very hard on this. My question is, they said that because this was delayed, remember this was supposed to come out like in June. This was supposed to come out late June. Because it was delayed, it was because they kept throwing out songs and replacing them with what they said were better songs. So I would love to know the garbage songs that they got rid of because they must have been truly terrible songs to replace with these very insanely average to below average songs. Again, 
Only a couple of these, I would say, are above average, and they're they're not even. Like when I hear a new song on an, on an album, and I only listen, again I only listen to a couple bands, but a new song on an album or a, a new single in general, I, like if you can remember it afterwards, at least it was memorable. Dark Side truly is the only song that sticks with me after, and I think it's just literally because it's so catchy. If I think really hard about Pin the Grenade, I can hear the, the chorus going in my head, okay? I can hear that. Uh, if I listen to, if I think about Heaven really hard, I can hear it in my head. But if I'm not, it's not going to be a song that just pops up in my head, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I, I cover Green Day on this channel, and their newest song, Father of All, Blank, it's not a good song, I would say. I'd say it's an average song. When I first listened to it, I thought it was a very, very awful song. But say what you want, whether you loved or hate that song, it's very different. And I can still think of it, and it still comes to my head sometimes. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of it, it still pops up in my head because it's just so different, and it's memorable. Like, I can remember that song. Even if I don't like it, I can remember it. You know, I don't like Blame It On My Youth. I don't like the I, like I don't like ha half these songs are just songs that I'm never going to listen to ever again and so they're never going to pop in my head. And that's another thing is, you know when I talk about like lack of passion, a lack of like originality that they all sound the same. It sounds like a B a B-side album. It sounds like rejected songs of California and then whatever came next. It doesn't sound exactly like California. This album isn't California Part 2. A lot of people were, uh, you know, worried that this album would be California Part 2. To be honest, at this point right now, I would have taken that. I would have taken a California Part 2. In fact, I want a California Part 2 right now. It's upsetting. I wish I had, you know, nicer things to say about it. There are some okay songs. There's some okay parts of songs. I think a lot of songs have at least one good thing about them, but then they just go in the opposite direction. You could argue a lot of these songs are actually below average to bad, but because they have one decent thing in some 30 second range of the song it saves the song in general so pretty much there's one bad thing and one good thing with every song and then it kind of evens out to where the song is just plainly average and i don't want that from blink i want the best from blink uh we're gonna be making more videos over the next couple days of how to fix this what needs to happen i do want to talk about the album more but i want to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments below have you listened to nine yet what's your favorite song what's your least favorite song again i would say dark side is my favorite i don't really have a least favorite because none of them really stick out enough to say they're the worst uh, but let me know in the comments below make sure you guys subscribe to our youtube channel podcast now hit that bell icon so you guys know these videos go up and thank you as always for watching i hope to see you all on the next video